Good morning, everyone. It is lovely to be here with you today, and uh, we're, we're quite excited for our service that's ahead of us. And uh, as always, if you're new today, my name's Phil, and I'm the minister of the church, and it's great to have you with us. Uh, at the end of our service, we will be uh, staying. Our coffee shop will be open. If you'd like to stay and have uh, a coffee or a tea, please feel free to do so. Uh, if, like me, you've got a roast in the oven and you need to disappear home, then you also are excused to do likewise. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, it's just really nice to be able to have all of you with us. Uh, as, a, as a church, we've been spending uh, about the last several months, we've been nearly eight months, nine months, I think now, uh, looking at the concept of, of how do we further our relationship with God uh, in spite of maybe not having people around us. And particularly when we were in lockdown, this was quite a, a vital thing for us as we were beginning to realize that the things that we depend upon, especially when it comes to church, is not just teaching, but is also kind of like doing life together and faith together. So how do we take responsibility for our own spiritual walk as we do so without that kind of rubbing of shoulders with others uh, around us? And so we've began to look at this idea of like exploring disciplines uh, or exploring habits that uh, actually increase our relationship with God. Uh, and so today we're going to be continuing by looking at that. We're going to be looking at the concept of service. How do we serve others? Why did it matter? What does Jesus teach us about that? We're going to be exploring that uh, a little bit um, today and over the next couple of weeks as we begin to delve into how will that affect the way that we interact with each other within church, but also with other people outside of church. And actually, Jesus has a lot to say on this subject. So it's going to be a lot of fun to kind of go through and do a little bit of looking at this. Now, uh, as a habit, talking about habits that are good to have, uh, our church service starts usually with a moment of silence. And I'm going to encourage us just to do that. For us, this has become almost one of those rituals that actually, if we do it properly, brings us life. If we just go through it for the routine, then it ceases to do that. So this is something that I want for you to embrace and really get behind. But I also want to suggest that this isn't just a habit that you have at church for like 30 seconds to a minute, but this is something that you build into your day-to-day -day life. We spent quite a long time looking at the idea of, well, how do we slow down? Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, my week has been very hectic. Uh, I, each of us have had different things going on. My family from, uh, from Yorkshire arrived on Wednesday, which is very lovely. So uh, our household, it was Nick and myself and our dog, plus then my mom and my dad and their dog. That was great. We can manage that. Uh, and then uh, my sister arrived on Friday and joined the party with her husband and four children. So we ended up with 10 people. Let's get, let's get this right. 10 people, two dogs, three chickens, and a cat. Four chickens, I think you'll find. Four chickens <laughs> and a cat. So, uh, so yeah, so that, it's been, it, which has been lovely chaos. But at the end of the day, you know, when you suddenly find your house empty again and, and naturally then having to tidy up after as well, especially when uh, our two twins uh, are two years old. There is an element of like just being able to breathe again. Uh, and, and I just want to suggest to you, listen, I don't know what your week's been like. You know, my, my week's been crazy, but in a really good way. I also know what it's like to have a crazy week that's not in a good way. And so f one of the things that we've been learning to do is this idea of actually just pressing pause, just pulling ourselves away from the chaos and saying, I'm going to pop the chaos here. And I'm actually just going to try and just take a moment to slow my breathing down, to, to slow my thought process down and try and be in the moment and then invite God into that moment with me. Does that make sense? Because this is something that we've been looking at as a concept of how do we go about doing that. And so at the beginning of our services, we do just that. And so we're just going to leave a prolonged uh, silence and then I'm going to open up in prayer. But silence can be deafening which the terminology seems to define itself, doesn't it? But, it? but it can be. And that's because we're left alone with our own thoughts. But I just want to encourage you just to say, actually, I'm just going to embrace the silence and just allow my heart, my mind to just still itself. For those of you that are parents, if you've got kids and they go nuts during this point, which tends to happen, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, and, uh, but we're just going to just try and do this together as a group. And then I'll open up in prayer, and then I'll hand over to Nikki and the band as they lead us in worship. But before we get there, 
Let's just embrace the silence together and then we'll pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, Lord, with thankful hearts. Each of us have got so much in our lives that we can be thankful for, and we choose to focus on those things this morning. And Lord, we just say that you, you are good. We need reminding of that sometimes, especially when life seems to take us over. Holy Spirit, we just invite you to come here to engage with us, to fill us afresh this morning. Would you begin to unlock our hearts to the things of you? Lord, that we might begin to know you more. Lord, we ask that you would speak to our hearts and to our minds this morning. That as we draw close to you through sung worship, through the reading of scripture, through the word, Lord, through all of the various different bits and pieces this morning, Lord, we ask as we draw close to you that you would draw close to us. Inhabit this place. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to encourage you to stand if you can and join us in worshiping our God in song.
Show. 
I just love the words of that song because you are beautiful and we are your children. And God, we want to seek you and we want to live like you. And that is why we are here, why we're gathered together, Lord, to learn more about you. So we pray, Lord, that you will fill this place, that you will teach us more about how we should be living for you. We ask this in your name. Amen. Guys, please do take your seats. We are incredibly privileged to have uh, so many uh, children, uh, especially on the journey that we've come, which is wonderful. Uh, And so we're going to move into our children's slot, and we're very blessed to have Naomi with us, who's going to be coming and uh, and reading a story to us. So, uh, Naomi, over to you. Good morning. morning. Now, today's story is called Nia, but really it's from Psalm 139. And 139 is a very beautiful psalm which I'm sure many of us know and keep in our hearts. And I just pray now that it speaks into all our hearts, not just the children, but speaks into all our hearts this morning because this is David's psalm, but it's God speaking through and it's very, very wonderful to hear how God is just with us all the time close to us and you can't get away from him because he loves us with such a big love. So are you ready? So here you can see the children are in a hot air balloon and they're going up, up, up into the sky. God is my father who made everything and I am a little explorer of the wide world. He is near me and he protects me. He sees me and he knows me. He is strong and he looks after me. He is with me always. This little person has gone into a very cold place. Can you see that? However far I go, he is always near me. I could climb the biggest mountain. I could fly to the highest star. Look, they're in a rocket. He's taking the cat with him. I could dive into the deepest sea. Down, down, down. Right down. Where all the fishes and the sea creatures are. Great pictures, aren't they? I could sail far, far away to the North Pole. And God would still be there. See the penguins? (laughs) I could trek through the jungles. This little person's going through the jungle, look. You see all the animals? Monkeys? Beautiful coloured birds. I could ride through the deserts. Look. He's gone through the desert now. He's on a camel. Can you see that? (laughs) I could zoom as fast as light. Zooming on a really fast car. God would still be there. (laughs) 
now, even in the dark at night. This person's going to bed now, look, and he's looking at the same book. (laughs) And they say, he is still with me there. When you go to bed at night and it's a bit dark, sometimes that's a fear that we all have, isn't it? We don't like it. But he's still there. He stays close to me. And he won't ever leave me. Not ever. Because I am his little child. And he loves me. Amen. I did. I did. I did. (laughs) Because it's like a prayer. I know that uh, I know that you all come to church to listen to my absolutely incredible sermons. Uh, I, I think actually the reality is Naomi does a much better job. That story was beautiful, wasn't it? So we're just going to pray for our young people uh, as they uh, leave, um, and then uh, and then we'll take our offering. But let's uh, let's just pray for our youngsters and also for ourselves as well as we're about to kind of hear uh, a little bit for ourselves as well. So let's just take a moment and pray. Father, I thank you. Lord, for our young people that are here, Lord, I thank you for for those who are on holiday at the moment and who are elsewhere. Lord, we thank you that, Lord, that our our church is not just uh, a a, a select group of people, but Lord, that we go right across the ages. And Lord, these children are not the church of tomorrow. They are very much part of our church today. And so, Lord, as they go out, I pray that you would speak to them through the crafts, through the activities, the stories, and the things that they do. And for us also, Lord, as we uh, delve into our uh, scriptures for today, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us also. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. (laughs) So at this point, we would normally pass around an offering basket, but obviously still we're uh, trying to keep within uh, the the most safest practices that we can as a church. so there is a basket on the chair, uh, and if you're leaving and you'd like to um, give that as your chance to offer, then that's fantastic. If you uh, find it easier to do it through uh, our online facilities, um, our bank account details are on the screen. Uh, we also use Just Giving as well, if that's something that helps those of you who are at home who are watching, uh, and also those of you who are in-house. Um, so, uh, so that's a fantastic way to be able to give as well. So... Let's, uh, let's take a look at what we're going to be talking about today. So as I've already kind of given a bit of a brief explanation uh, that we are here today uh, and we're going to be looking at the concept of service and this idea of well, what is service. And I think for many of us, especially that do church, we hear the word service and that means, well, that's the church service. Uh, and so I'm not talking to you about the necessity for the church service, but I'm actually talking about the concept of how do we serve others uh, and why does it matter. Uh, To start off and to give you a clear illustration of the full depth to what I'm going about today, I'm going to introduce you to my four chickens, uh, which will be on the screen any moment. I have four chickens. I do, I promise. Ah, here we go. I have four chickens. Uh, And as you can see, uh, we've got three Rhode Island Reds, uh, and we've got a little black bantam at the back there. Not the greatest of pictures. I got to church and said, oh, I should have taken a picture. Nick, have you got any pictures of chickens? Anyway, so this is what we managed to get you. So uh, at the back, we've got Muriel, uh, which is our bantam. She's a a little one about this big. Uh, And then we've got, as I said, the three Rhode Island Reds, which is Mabel, Maisie, and Mavis, all M's. Uh, and uh, we rescued the three that you can see at the front. Um, and, uh, and these three came to us with no feathers. They had feathers on their necks and heads and shoulders, but pretty much they came to us uh, already pre-plucked. That was a joke, by the way. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, but we, we basically, we adopted these chickens uh, and have given them another life. They came to us from, uh, from a a caged factory, uh, and so that they'd never experienced life outside of that environment. So when we introduced them uh, to our dog, they had no idea that they should be afraid of him. That was interesting. 
Uh, and uh, my dog would very much like to, if you've met my dog Malachi, uh, he's a, a fox red cocker spaniel, so full of life, and he just desperately wants to wander around with the chickens in his mouth. Uh, so uh, we've got to stop that, so that's obviously not allowed. Uh, we've got a, a British blue grey uh, cat that we rescued a few years back, and she's coming up now to about 13. And uh, in her heyday, she was a, a very prominent hunter uh, and used to come back with the biggest pigeons. And you wonder, she, she's uh, actually very tiny. She's only about this big and then her tail. So, small cat. She went out into our garden and uh, Mabel, who is by far the most sure of herself, saw the cat from the other side and was so intrigued to see what this animal was made this wonderful noise and sprinted across the garden towards the cat and the cat just did this and went backwards and ran inside the house and now wants nothing to do with the chickens, which is good. Mabel set them in place. But I don't know if you've ever, if you know anything about chickens, there is a hierarchy among chickens. Now, we, uh, we got uh, Mabel first, um, which is the, uh, the black one that you saw on the screen earlier, uh, and she is tiny. I mean, she's got to be at least half the size of the others. Uh, but she was there and well-established primary. So then when these three chickens came, uh, there was all manner of fights going on. And for us, it's really difficult because, you know, these are our pets and we've brought them into our house and we want them to be nice to each other. And you're almost kind of saying, no, stop it. But you need to understand that chickens need this hierarchy in order to be able to work out how they fit into that society. Uh, I, was, uh, I read an interesting article that one of the, the reasons why uh, so many chickens uh, come out of battery farms with no feathers uh, and, and in the state that they're in is because a chicken can manage, I believe, to somewhere around about 100 chickens and it can work out where its hierarchy is. But in a place where there are more than 100 chickens, chaos exists because they can't work out a hierarchy so everybody attacks everybody. So obviously when these chickens came to us, like we were, we were you know, desperate to try and allow them to get through this as quick as possible. Uh, but we very quickly established that there is definitely a hierarchy in our chickens, with Mavis being definitely at the bottom. Muriel, the tiniest one, being clearly at the top. Uh, and then Mavis and Mabel somewhere in the middle. Um, but chickens, now you're coming to church not to listen to me talk about my pets. I mean, that's, that's true, isn't it? But yet, to be fair, as much as we laugh at chickens for that, actually we find ourselves doing that as well, don't we? We do it in our place of work. You know, we like to know who's, who's above who. We like to be able to try and work that out. Uh, within, quite often within friendship circles, there are those who are probably slightly more dominant than others. Uh, and it's quite a, a, almost a natural thing within life. And so you'd almost expect to see that equally within church as well. So as we begin to kind of take a look at, well, what does Jesus tell us about this? Uh, I want you to kind of come with me on a journey as we uh, experience some of this almost pecking order kind of concept uh, of, of, of the way that Jesus deals with this. So um, in Matthew's gospel, uh, in chapter 20, there is a, a, an interesting thing that happens. Uh, I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation, and it reads as follows. <clears throat> then the mother of James and John and the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectively to ask for favor. What is your request? He asked. She replied, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in the place of honor next to you, one to the right and the other to the left. But Jesus answered by saying to them, you don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? Oh yes, they replied, we are able. And Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup, but I have no right to say who will sit on my right or on my left. My father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. But Jesus called them together and said, You know what the rulers in this world lord it over the people, 
and their officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become a slave. For even the Son of Man cannot, uh, came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom. Okay, so here we see what is actually quite a, 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 a usual request, or it seems relatively normal in its initial. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love that the Bible tells us that the disciples, when they heard this question, how did they react? Did they applaud them? Did they say, well done for getting your mother involved? No, it says they were indignant. I love that term, because if I was there, and that request had been given whilst I was present, I would be indignant too, wouldn't you? There's a sense of like, hold on, how dare you ask of that? You know, do you think you're better than me? It's instant, isn't it? We feel it. And so, but what we got to understand is that um, what the mother here is asking, she's got the best of intentions for her sons. And for those of you who are parents, you know, you, obviously your children are definitely better than everybody else's children. Isn't that right? But there's almost that kind of like sense of she's asking. And what is she asking? She's asking that in the kingdom that her sons would sit in the two most uh, highest places of honor. What she's actually asking is not a heaven-based question. What she's actually asking is according to what everybody else thought at the time. Jesus had come and he was beginning to teach a very different style of faith to everything that had been taught up to that point. And everybody saw that he was going to be the Messiah, that, that fitted in with everything that they understood. And the concept that they understood was that as a Messiah, he would liberate the people. And they thought it was physical liberation. So they're expecting the kingdom that Jesus is about to set up to be one that is going to bring uh, a rid of the Roman Empire, that Israel will be restored to its place uh, of wealth and honor among the nations, and that Jesus would be the rightful king. This is what they're expecting. So what she's actually saying is, the two most pl uh, powerful places of honor, would you give them to my son? But, but agree this now whilst it's not much, but then when it comes into place, let it be so. So that's what she's asking. Jesus' reply actually tells us so much about his wider vision. So this isn't, he's not saying, you know, you're asking for me to be the king and for my, your two sons to be the prime ministers or, you know, the, some state of fair or something like that. What he replies is by saying that actually in heaven, he hasn't got that place to be able to say who can and can't because it's already been declared. So his answer is actually quite different. Uh, and now you'd think by the time that we actually got to the end, uh, when Jesus actually dies, that with all of the statements that Jesus has said, that they would have expected it. I'm still surprised when he gets to the end that there's, they've not, the penny has not dropped. They still have not understood what Jesus is actually about. But then he tells us this kind of absolute turnaround statement. And that turnaround statement is that he says, listen, the rulers of the world lorded over the people. And, I mean, we see that. We see that even with our own government. I mean, not talking overly political, but it's not what you know, it is most certainly who you know, isn't it? You know, we've just, we've been reading about, uh, through uh, the times of COVID, of how uh, some of those, you know, uh, top jobs have been given to friends, how contracts have been given to people that probably shouldn't have had it and all that sort of stuff. We see that, that once, you're, once you're in that kind of place of power, that, that you've almost got the right to say and do as you want. And what Jesus actually says here is that actually, but among you, verse 26, it will be different. But among you, it will be different. So there's a requirement for it to be different. I'm going to use a, another illustration uh, as well. We're going to bump through to uh, Luke in chapter 9. And uh, again, something very similar begins to, uh, to, to happen. Uh, and uh, in verse 46 through to 48, uh, it reads as follows. Then the disciples began arguing about who of them was the greatest. But Jesus knew their thoughts and brought a little child to his side and said to them, anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf 
welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes my Father who sent me. Whoever is the least among you is the greatest. Now, all of this is backwards, much like the majority of other of Jesus' statements. Is he saying, the world says this, humanity expects this, this is what you're so used to. But in the kingdom of God, it's different, and it has to be different. And look at how he explains it by bringing a child in, and then kind of it goes about and explaining that, that actually it, it's, we've got to be welcoming. And I'm always struck by uh, these statements that Jesus makes. And actually, he goes about it from his birth right through to his death. Jesus doesn't come and is not born into King Herod's wonderful temple, uh, and, and, and is not, uh, sorry, into the temple, uh, into the palace, but instead he's born into a stable. The, the living God, who has the choice of where he would be born, chooses to be born into the most lowliest of places. He chooses to do it and live life in a way that he, he could very well have dressed in the most amazing of clothes and rubbed shoulders with the most amazing, eating the best of the food that the world had to offer. And let's face it, as humanity, we should have done that for him because that's what we expect. That's our idea of greatness. Yet Jesus' idea of greatness is quite the opposite. It's to walk among. It is to bless. It is to bring life in its fullness to everybody, not just the elite. And that defies everything that the world tells us. And then in the end, when we see Jesus on the cross, he dies a criminal's death, not that of somebody of power. Okay? So I just we need to grasp this, that Jesus in everything he does embodies these statements that he's saying. If you were with us uh, last year, we spent a bit of time looking uh, at a particular uh, passage out of John's Gospel. Well, in fact, actually, we looked at the entirety of John's Gospel. But for me, one of my favorite parts is in chapter 13. And so I'm just going to read a little bit. Of, I'm going to unpack it a bit just so that we can understand it. Uh, and then we'll actually see how this fits into the wider. So let's do this together. So chapter 13. Verse 1, it says, Before the Passover celebrations, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave the world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he had around him. When he came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested. You will never, ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash your feet, you will not belong to me. Simon, Iscari Simon Peter uh, exclaimed, then wash my hands and my head as well, Lord, not just my feet. So the story continues. So let's just take a brief look at this as a concept First of all, uh, if I was to say to everybody now, please take off your shoes and your socks, and I'm going to come around and wash your feet. How many of you would be comfortable with that? Yeah? All of you, apparently. Yeah, absolutely. Corns and all. So, no, that's not what we're talking about here. But why? Because actually, to be fair, it's so foreign to any aspect of our culture um, that, you know, it just, it, it, it almost makes us feel a little bit weird. I mean, the idea of somebody playing with my toes, I'm not really up for that. The idea of somebody washing our feet, it doesn't make sense. And that's because we live in a very different climate. So uh, if you would, I want you to just try and picture with me exactly what Jesus is doing here. And that is, it starts off actually by us understanding the place to which Jesus is in. So he's not in Great Britain, you know, not as... Uh, as the song Jerusalem might suggest, but no, he actually is in Israel. 
Uh, and, and actually, he's, he's in a place which is very hot. It is very dusty. So those are your first two things that you need to grab hold of. Secondly, most of us that are here are in closed shoes or footwear. Maybe a few of you among maybe wearing some nice sandals. Uh, sometimes I occasionally wear flip-flops in the heat of summer, right? But for the most of the time, we tend to wear shoes where we've even got socks on as well. But Jesus would be wearing sandals because that was the norm. And in fact, if you still go to the Middle East, that is still the chosen footwear. Why? Because it's hot and you don't want sweaty feet. So first of all, so you've got to understand, we know it's now, it's very hot, it's very dry, it's very dusty, and people are wearing sandals. The next thing you need to grasp as well is that not, you know, it's hard for us to imagine this, but if you were to go back even 50 years, cars were an unusual thing to see. If we go back to Jesus' time, they would be very, very unusual to see, yes? And that's because there weren't cars. But So what was the mode of transport? Well, it was animals. So it would be donkeys, it would be oxes. If you had a lot of money, it would be horses. That there would be livestock around everywhere. So as you walked through a bustling street, there would be quite often sheep and goats. There'd be all manners of stuff. Now, we, if we're lucky, the only time that we see any form of animal, it would be whilst we're wandering around Lidl or a co-op. We rarely see animals at all. But there, that would be the case, which would mean that then there's no, um, we've got horses, um, Nick's, Nick's got horses, and uh, you know they, they don't poo where you want them to, it just happens wherever they are, that's the nature of it. Which in term also means the streets of Israel, especially at this time, would have been bustling with people, with animals, and with dung. So it would be usual for by the time you got to dinner time and you've been wandering around all day with hot and sweaty feet which have therefore collected the dust that's now caked upon you the likelihood is you've probably stepped in something that's a little bit on the slightly smelly side by the time you get to dinner you're not going to be uh, enjoying your feet let's put it that way next thing we also need to understand is that in israel especially at that time period that people didn't sit on tables and chairs you know they didn't have the best silverware out and the best crockery. That's not the way they did things. They sat on the floor, on cushions, around low tables that would be close to what you might imagine is your coffee table, and that they would recline on each other, which would mean that their feet would be kind of somewhere around the person sat next to them. So imagine you have spent all day walking around, and your sandals and your feet are caked with mud, sweat, and other stuff. And as you're reclining, your feet are going to be somewhere next to the person next to you, and you're about to eat. Would you not feel embarrassed? You would. I would. So the concept of the washing of feet makes sense. But again, also what we miss here is that this is a, this is, it's, it's almost like Christmas dinner, Passover. It's like, it's the big meal of the Jewish uh, custom, and so there's a, an element of excitement, but it's also, it's the best. Now, if you read earlier on in all four of the Gospels, there, there, there's certain people that have been sent ahead to prepare this meal, uh, and to prepare this meal means not just to book the room, it means not just to book the food, but it also means to book the correct people to be there to serve. And again, time period-wise, servants and slaves is quite a normal thing. And so if you're having a big party and there's going to be 13 blokes sitting down to eat together, they're expecting that there will be somebody who is there to serve them. So for the moment that they walk in, that their feet would be washed, that their hands would be washed, and they could sit down and eat and enjoy a meal. But clearly something has been forgotten here because that's not happened. And so imagine that you are Simon Peter, and again, we, we see him going, are you going to wash my feet? There's a shock. And we miss the shock. That shock is because at that point, before Jesus stands up, there is the most awkward silence in the room. And that's because they're all sitting there trying to work out who's the greatest. Why? So they can work out who's the least because then the least's job is to wash their feet. Yes? So can you understand why there's this kind of like sense of just almost awkwardness that's going on? Because they're trying to work out. Somebody's forgotten something. 
there isn't somebody to wash their feet. Well, I'm not going to do it. Uh, now, you know, you can imagine them looking around and going, well, I think, I think I'm in higher standing than you. I'm not so sure about you, uh, but I'm not going to wash your feet. As you can see this kind of like sense of mentality that's going on. So as, as soon as who stands up to wash the feet, it is by all standards the greatest in the room. This is wrong. It shouldn't be happening. So when he gets to Peter, and Peter's like, no, you're not going to wash my feet. That's because he recognizes if anybody should be washing anybody's feet, it should be Peter washing Jesus' feet. Does that make sense? So this is why this is so big. And for us, as we read this, we don't get it. So we've maybe skimmed over this. Who knows how many times? So I just want to just help you understand that Jesus' mentality here is that he longs to serve. And then when he, I love Peter, just speak first, think second. Uh, his response is, uh, well then, uh, then wash my hand, after being told, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. And then Peter's response is almost like, then bathe the entirety of me, that I may all belong to you. Uh, I, just, I, I just love this response. So what, what does this have to do with anything? Um, again, I'm not telling you that when guests come to your house, that you should be washing their feet. But what I am saying to you is this is that Jesus' idea of how the greatest and the least works is so countercultural to anything we know. This idea that actually we should be wanting to serve others. And it's not out of a sense of duty. I don't ever get that from anything that Jesus does. I don't get it that he's doing it because that's what's expected in the kingdom. He's doing it because he genuinely loves and that's why the call throughout pretty much the entirety of John's gospel is, if you love me, then follow my commands. As you read through John's letters, again, it's constantly about this concept of love one another. This is why love has to be at the core. And this idea that actually we see somebody else in need and we should be the first, regardless of where our standing is in life, inside or outside of church, if you're a bank manager, if you're a teacher, if you're a where, whatever it is that you do for a, a living of, of the highest within the, uh, the community, that when we see somebody in need, our instant reaction should be, how can I help? What can I do? How can I bless? And out of that sense of especially the more closer that we get to God, the more this should be an instantaneous reaction. How do we go about building relationships and friendships? How many times have you had people in church, for example, over to your house for a meal? Maybe when somebody turns up new and maybe you've never seen them before, are we going to be the sort of church that says, hi, you're welcome, what's your name? Have you got any plans for dinner? You know, like, are we going to be that sort of a church that actually is, is genuinely loving and sees the difficulties in other people's lives and says, how can I help? For those of you who have been mothers and who now that your children have flown the nest and maybe as you look at other families and you kind of say, I remember being where you were and then maybe coming alongside even with, I don't know, words of wisdom or even, how can I help? What's it like to be able to say to somebody, actually, listen, I've been where you are and I know the pressure that it is to try and raise children and, and do jobs and, you know, maybe if you want, I'll happily sit your kids one night so you guys can go out on a date. I mean, there's so many ways that we can serve. There's so many ways that we can step into the void, that we can see other people's pains and allow that pain to be able to say, actually, that makes me want to react and then see it through. In, in this, it's not, that, it's not that Jesus is saying that it inverts the concept of leadership. It's not that the ladder is turned upside down in the pecking order that the least, that the greatest swap places. Because if that's the case, then Jesus would have handed over his ministry to somebody else. What he's actually saying is this whole idea of hierarchy disappears. I mean, Jesus still, can, still carries authority and he still leads, but how he leads is not the way that we imagine. It's not barking orders and expecting people to do it's instead saying, right, how can we do this? 
How can we sort this together? How can we team this together? And how can we move forwards? How can we fill the void? How can we see somebody else's pain and be able to step into it and actually be a source of life and a source of light? Richard Foster, as he wrote about this, stated this. Therefore, the spiritual authority of Jesus is an authority not found in a position or a title, but in a towel. I just love that. The thing that we think of that carries the authority, is it the position that we hold in life? Richard Foster says no. Is it the title that we hold? Again, Richard Foster says no. What should help us to be able to understand what true leadership is? He suggests, just as Jesus did, it's the towel, it's the service, it's how to serve. And this, I think, is at the foundation of majority of what Jesus does in his ministry. And I want to encourage you in this up and coming week to pray about that. Pray that God would break your heart for the, for the things around you. The things that move him would be the things that move us. Begin to wander around in the moment and allowing ourselves to see other people as they are. Struggles and all. And then ask, God, how can I be you in this situation? Let's just take a moment just to allow that to sink in. Again, embracing the silence. Then I'll close in prayer. I'm going to hand over to Nick and the band as they lead us in our final song. But uh, before we get there, let's, let's just allow the words that perhaps we've heard just now just sink in a little bit. Allow God, through the power of his spirit, to speak to you this moment. Heavenly Father, the example that you set us almost feels too difficult to live to. But Lord, you never ask us to do it on our own. Lord, you ask us to do it in your strength. So God, here in this moment now, we just ask that you would fill us afresh with your spirit. Give us the strength that we need at every moment. Lord, as we've looked at this idea of learning to slow ourselves down and to try and be in the moment, Lord, may this be something that we keep coming back to. And Lord, that as we are in the moment and we invite you to join us in the moment, open our eyes to the difficulties around us. And Lord, that we might see, perhaps for the first time, other people's struggles and realize that actually we may hold a key to bringing life and hope to them in their lives. So Lord, we the fragile, we the broken, we who are struggling ourselves, fall upon you and say, Lord, give us the strength we need, not just for our own situations, but Lord, that we might be a blessing to those around us. God, we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Shall we stand and sing together our final song, which is uh, No Longer Slaves? <laughs>
Father, we thank you for everything that you have done for us. Thank you that we are your family. And Lord, we pray that as we go out into our week, whatever that may look like, that we, you'll show us how we can serve you the best way that we can, that the way that you, Jesus Christ, would if you were here. And we ask this in your name. Amen.